and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. These are two passages uh, that we have both in uh, the Exodus passage and in the gospel that I hope stick with you. I hope they're passages that you refer to again and again uh, to help you in your walk of faith because I think they're pivotal. And most of us remember that story from Exodus, the, the story of the burning bush. And it strikes us as a youngster because it's just so outside of anything we've seen before. This whole idea of, of Moses uh, coming upon a bush that will not be consumed yet has this enormous flame and the presence of God being there. And we all sort of think what it must be like to be in that holy moment. Uh, but there are three things that I want you to take from that story. One is how shocking it would be to Moses that God would call him. God would call Moses. So we think about what makes somebody a leader and the things that we've touted uh, in the news that give us cre credibility as a leader. Think of Moses. He is a murderer fleeing for his safety. He's an escapee from the Egyptian police. And he has a speech impediment. So God calls as a leader the person to deliver God's people. One, he doesn't do it by himself. And two, he calls a broken man living in hiding with a speech impediment. But he says, I need you. And two, how does he know what's going on? How does God know that there's a need? And there's another beautiful line. I hear the cries of my people see their pain and their suffering, I know their condition. And you hear the pathos in it, the suffering that God has for God's people. And he says, I need you, Moses, in all of your imperfection, in your stuttering, in your fleeing for your life, in everything that you see as broken, I need you to help my people. And the third piece that Moses has already gotten by this point is that God is not who he expects God to be. God says, I am who I am, which is one of the most frustrating things for us because we want God to be who Ben wants God to be. I am who Ben says I am. And we do. As little children, we form the image of God based on our parents. Psychologists have told us that. And just think about when Moses heard this, gods were formed out of human minds desiring order if you were infertile, you had a god of fertility. If you needed uh, good crops, you had gods of, uh, of good weather. You created the gods to create the world you wanted. And you also created the gods to make sense of the world that you experienced. So a god who steps away and says, I am who I am. What a declarative statement. Not the god that you make me to be. Not the god that you bend me to be for your convenience. But I am who I am. We look back at the first two. I'm the God who calls the broken and says that you can lead my people to freedom. God who doesn't sit idly by, but who watches and knows the suffering of God's people and aches for it and can't sit idly, but depends on us. I am who I am. And then we have today's gospel. And this is a gospel that I've talked to uh, when we talk about the, the leaders of Stephen, the Stephen ministry get together. And I think as you deal with pastoral care, know this passage. I have seen the damage that we do to ourselves. We need the world to make sense. We need chaos not to be so chaotic. And we need order, even if it compounds our brokenness and our woundedness. I have been in, uh, in hospitals where people who've lost children uh, well into the, the, the birthing process are convinced, absolutely convinced, it's because they stopped going to church and that this was God's punishment, which compounds the suffering they're already going through. And the God that aches for them, the God that aches for God's people, the I am who I am who promises, I don't do that can't be the solve that that God wants to be because of what we've done to that. I've been in the hospitals where a man dying of cancer alone, disenfranchised from his family, is convinced that that cancer is his punishment for all of the ill repute living that he's done. 
And so we have today's gospel where Jesus says, do you think that those people who were, who were killed by Pilate, whose, whose blood was mixed with the sacrifices they were making to their God, uh, are any less children of God, were any less beloved by God, are being punished? You're out of your mind. These are beloved children of God. Do you think the people that happen to be walking under a tower that collapsed are any less beloved children of God, are being punished because uh, of something they did? God doesn't work that way. Whether you are riding high and you're so convinced that the reason that you're wealthy, that your house is warm, that you have all the clothes that you want and all of the luxuries of life are a gift from God, God's telling you, I think I love you more than that person that you walk by and try to ignore with blinders on as you walk by. No, that's a beloved child of God and I love them and I love you. And if we don't understand that, then we lose the I am who I am, not who you want me to be for your comfort, not who I want you to be or create you to be so that I can make order of chaos, not the God that condones walking by and losing sight of a child of God. But I am who I am. And you are called to bend your life to me, to the knowledge of the God who cries and hears the cries of God's people. God who calls us to meet those needs. That God. And as we are called to repent, it's worth knowing what that word repent means. Metanoia. To get outside of our mind. It's not a slap on the wrist to say you're doing things wrong uh, and turn in the other direction. It's a call like the call that Jesus makes to Peter to get beyond himself. That do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you. The call to be more than you thought you could be, to understand your life in fuller terms, to understand your life like Moses heard it. Yes, you're fleeing. Yes, you're afraid. Yes, you've got a speech impediment, but you can be more than you thought you can be. I gave you gifts you haven't even begun to realize. Metanoia, get beyond to follow more faithfully the I am who I am. And we're called to do that. Then Jesus goes and tells the story of the fig tree. And so it's, it's worth paying attention to it, especially during this season where we're trying to improve our lives. How many times in the story of Scripture has God taken us where we are and challenged us to be more and understood when we fall short? And still encouraged us, sent more and more people to try to shape us until Jesus comes. And whenever we hear the gardener, think of the crazy mad hatter gardener who casts seeds everywhere. Whether it falls on rocky soil, whether it falls on fertile so soil, whether it falls on thin soil. Think of the gardener who met Mary, who is actually Jesus at the empty tomb. And know that Jesus is that gardener that's always begging for us to bear fruit. Always giving us one more chance. Always <clears throat> calling us to work harder. To be more fully the person that God made us to be. Not beating us down with it, but challenging us to follow more faithfully the I am who I am. Whenever I think of the fig tree, I can't help but think of, of my experience with a fig tree, the, the fig tree that we planted uh, the year before my father-in-law died from his, uh, from his property in the first couple years where it, nothing happened. And I've told the story before, but it's sort of amazing. It was we gave up on it. Uh, couldn't even tell you what part of the, the backyard it was planted. And then year after year, we'd go over and we'd see nothing there. And then Four or five years later, all of a sudden, something came up, and we thought, well, it'll never grow into much of anything, and the next year, it grew a little bigger, and it still hadn't borne any fruit, uh, and by this point time, it's eight, nine years later, and all of a sudden, I remember that first fig, that, 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 that the fig tree, and I thought about every time I hear it, I think about the God that waits that long for us each year and believes that we can bear fruit, that challenges us to bear fruit. I also think about that call that we all have to do the most with the time that we've been given. Jesus says uh, that life is short, and I think of our blessing. Uh, life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind. Make haste to love. That's what this is about. Jesus challenging us to realize that we are called in the time that we're given to bend our lives as close as we possibly can to that I am who I am, to that God who waits there for us to help those crying voices in the wilderness, who waits there for us to help those who are suffering, to help affirm to each person 
that they're a beloved child of God, whether their face is down in the ground or whether they're riding high. But that I am loves them and is love and binds us all together in that journey towards, towards God. Amen.